Okay, so I'm just going to give it a minute just to let everybody, people come in and get their audio sorted out and so on. And then we will start. Okay, so if I can just remind everybody to mute their mics. Uh, so this is uh, the latest uh, event in a series of events uh, that Grow Hackney are organizing. Uh, everyone probably knows Grow, but if you don't, uh, it's an experiment, an ethical and sustainable business, a venue based in Hackney Wick in London and of course like all other music venues and bars and so on at the moment it's closed but um, they are running an amazing series of events including author talks and online music events and artist talks uh, to celebrate the creativity and diversity of Grow's events program and this event series is supported by the cultural recovery grant administered by the Arts Council England so thank you to the Arts Council be live streamed and recorded tonight and this will be archived on the GROW website. GROW also sometimes use screen grabs for publicity purposes so please be aware that if you're not comfortable with being recorded um, you'll need to switch off your webcam. The other thing is that there will be a Q&A at the end um, so please as we're going on do uh, put your thoughts and your comments and your questions in the chat and then at the end, I can put these to Julia and David. So uh, my name's Kay Mitchell, by the way. Uh, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to host this event uh, with two writers who I really admire. And I was just thinking actually about my personal connections to both of these writers. Julia is a friend of many years. Um, and actually, and we, we met a long time ago, but we sort of met properly and became friends in Berlin, which is appropriate given what she's gonna be reading from and talking about for part of this. Um, and David, I realized I was reading in the late eighties in Melody Maker um, and probably kind of wallpapering my bedroom, this is an embarrassing confession, with um, articles that you had written. So, um, so it's, it's really um, quite a privilege to be able to do this event. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce um, Julia first and I'm gonna ask her to read from this piece, really techno. Uh, then I'll introduce David, and David's going to read um, from his book, Mars by 1980. Um, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion between us. Um, and I'll maybe also ask them to read from some other work, from Work in Progress, um, and Julia, maybe from her recent book, Radical Attention. And we'll also open it out to questions and thoughts from the audience. So again, do put those questions in the chat as we go along. Okay, so Julia's gonna go first. So Julia Bell is a novelist, a poet, an essayist, and a short story writer. In 2018, her essay, Really Techno, uh, which is one of the things she's gonna read from tonight, was published in the White Review to widespread attention and acclaim. Indeed, it, it kind of went viral. And that's something I'm gonna be asking her about. Radical attention, which in the art of show and tell, very low tech here. Um, I have a copy of here is a book length essay, which asks how in the world of infinite distraction, attention can become radical. And this was published by Peninsula Press in 2020. It's a really beautiful little book um, that is incredibly compelling and um, also productive of great unease, I think, in the way that it reflects upon our contemporary culture. Julia's current projects include a memoir in verse with the title Hymnal. She's also the director of the MA Creative Writing at Birkbeck, University of London. So Julia, I ask you to read a bit from Really Techno um, to get us into thinking about <laughs> the relationships between music and writing um, and how to think particularly about the phenomenon of electronic music and the roles that it's played in our lives. 
Thank you. Yeah, it feels very strange to be reading about dancing and music rather than actually dancing to music, but we are where we are. So hopefully this will be enjoyable for those of you that have been uh, to Bergheim or have been to Berlin or been to a techno night, which I can see from some of the names here, there are many. Um, and I'm just going to read the beginning of this essay and then a paragraph from, from the middle. Ich bin einer, I say, when my turn comes, I am one. I've been here before, outside this colossal power station in Friedrichshain, just over the Spree in the Old East, very near to where the Berlin Wall once stood. On previous occasions, I queued with friends, the first time for three hours on a balmy Saturday night, which also happened to be the club's birthday party. I got in just as the sun was coming up, the second time for 40 minutes in midwinter, the temperature a bone throbbing minus 11. Today, I'm acting like a Berliner and doing it solo on an indifferent Sunday in April. I'm not here to take drugs or get drunk. I'm not really looking to hook up. In fact, once I get in, if you dance too close to me, I'll probably move. I'm here as a 45-year-old woman to be on my own, surrounded by techno music played on one of the best sound systems in the world. The harder and louder, the better. The building towers over us, monolithic concrete and steel, graffiti covering the bottom floors. It's getting on for 3 p.m. and there's about half hour queue leading up to the entrance. Most of them are male, one mixed group of hopeful tourists who get refused. Two thickly bearded men who've obviously spent last night hooking up with each other. They have the kinetics of recent sex in the way they touch each other and shimmy to the muffled beat, which gets louder as we approach the door. In the final few meters, nobody speaks. We're within range of the bouncers now, and according to the websites that give advice on how to get in, drawing attention to yourself by being too loud will get you turned away. There's a whole mythology of cool around getting into this place, especially among 20-something corporate types and curious tourists. One time I saw a couple who looked like they'd emerged from a Vogue photo shoot or a private yacht party, or both. Nuclear suntans and white linens, dazzling, dazzling teeth, expensive gold jewellery, children of the hyper-wealthy, arguing petulantly with the bouncers because they'd been refused. This isn't a club for the beautiful people, although there are many beautiful people inside. It's a place that emerged from the East German queer punk scene, and what that couple didn't realise in their moneyed armour was that the door policy exists expressly to keep them out to stop the club being colonised by tourists, becoming some idea of the sleek life like the Buddha bar or Nobu or the terraces of Ibiza or some other high fashion hangout where the atmosphere is like a cross between a wake and a self-conscious teenage disco where everybody watches everybody else so fiercely that by the end of the evening their faces are flayed with the strain. The name is a synthesis of two Berlin districts which were separated by the wall, Kreuzberg and Friedrichshain. The club itself carved out of an old power station as big as the turbine hall of the Tate Modern. Sven Markvat, the head doorman, who famously turned away Britney Spears, has said that he wants people who look like they know how to party. I've only been once when he was on the door, in gold Elvis shades, his face full of piercings and tattoos, sovereign of the queue, impassive, a contemporary Captain Kurtz. Being outside, looking in, evokes in me an immediate, intense longing to be inside. The experience reminds me of an art installation I stumbled across once in a field in Norwich, a shack of grey corrugated iron from inside of which emanated some very loud and crunchy hip hop. Involuntarily, my body moved. I walked around the whole structure twice before realising that there was deliberately, obviously, no door. Queuing for Bergheim is a bit like this or rather like being part of a mass performance art piece which enacts purgatory. For some, just to have stood in the queue is enough, even if it means they have presented themselves to be turned away. I'm close enough now to see the faces of the bouncers. They're turning away a group of young Berliners in front of me who jump the queue, and a lone girl from Glasgow with her pineapple hair and stonewashed denim who told me she read about the place in a magazine. I'm in black hoodie and jeans, nothing glitzy or special. There's a terrible suspended pause and then it's my turn. I look him in the eye and fight a sudden urge to yawn. The bouncer smiles. How many times have you been here? He asks in English. I wonder what to say. None, many, a few. I wonder if I should lie. I know I'm showing my age. At 45, I look lived in these days. 
Perhaps I should know better. Now I'm entering middle age, I should know my place and restrict my public dancing to the occasional house party, where if I'm lucky after too many glasses of Prosecco, someone will spin me round to something with a Nile Rogers bass line and my heels will get stuck in the carpet. I came to Berlin partly to escape this, which is, like a lot of things, more pronounced in the UK than Europe. Single, still strong, child-free, I have a freedom and flexibility unavailable to many women my age. My child-free status is my liberation, but it also puts me out of time with some of my peers and the general oppressive conservative narrative of what we should be doing when, especially as a woman, and even more especially as a queer woman. Judith, now Jack Halberstam, and others have argued that it is not our sex acts which constitute queerness, but rather what we do with our time. They suggest that we try to think about queerness as an outcome of strange temporalities, imaginative life schedules and eccentric economic practices, so that we can detach sexual identity and come closer to understanding Foucault's comment in Friendship as a Way of Life, that homosexuality threatens people as a way of life rather than as a way of having sex. This is what the many hilarious websites which obsess about how to get into Bergheim don't get. This is primarily a queer club and you can't really pretend to be queer. Perhaps it's something you can become, but mostly it's something you just are. In the end, I say nothing. The bouncer nods me in and as always, the ego lifts. The first thing to happen once I'm over the threshold is the tricky business of my phone. Before the bag search, they take my smartphone and put a sticker over the camera lens and another on the screen to prevent me taking selfies. If they find you taking pictures, they'll throw you out. This one simple restriction creates an immediate shift in the atmosphere. No one is watching, or rather, no one is watching themselves watching the party. What happens in Bergheim stays in Bergheim. A quick search on Instagram under hashtag Bergheim reveals mostly pictures from the queue. Once inside, the space is liberated from the shadow world of social media, except as a means of telling your friends where you are. People who take their phones out for longer than a moment are frowned on, and it shows. In all the corners, chill-out rooms, and in the garden, people are actually talking to each other. The only network you need is inside the club. I'm just going to jump forward a little bit, and I'm going to read a bit about dancing because I have to, because I have been out dancing for so long. <laughs> I let myself into the rhythm and my limbs move of their own accord. I don't control it. I'm not making any rehearsed moves, just letting my nervous system respond to the beat. My arms and legs and torso move as if connected to the sound, bypassing consciousness. At some point I pass through the mirror into this uncanny techno place. I am not aware of myself. I am at once all body and no body. I am out of time, out of language, my mind all sensation. The sound makes shapes, red, green, purple, which become like a physical building that the beat starts to build around me. The music has a kind of architecture which I can see in my mind's eye. At this saturation, the sound creates its own spatial awareness, its own metaphysical structures. In this place, I am connected to something bigger than me, a place outside the ego. The split parts of me are, for these few moments, suddenly whole. On an atomic level, my physicality is being changed by the pressure waves coming from the speakers, from the movement of all the other humans around me. I'm on the dance floor and above it at the same time. Even though I'm surrounded by people, I'm solitary. I'm not even in a club on a dance floor, but in some other space entirely. I'm entering the trance. Bjork described it best. I had been away from Iceland for over a year, and when I returned for New Year, I stayed on top of a mountain. I went for a walk on my own and I saw the ice was thawing in the lava fields. All I could hear was the cackle of the ice echoing over hundreds of square miles. It was pitch black. The northern lights were swirling around and just below them was a layer of thick cloud. I could see the lights from all the towns in my childhood mirrored in the reflection of those clouds with the lava fields cackling below. It was really techno. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. I have, I have so many thoughts and questions about this piece, which I'm going to hold on to for a minute um, because I want to um, I want to introduce David and ask him to read as well, and then I can hopefully 
draw you into a discussion about some of the some points of contact I think um, between what you're doing in these respective pieces or books. So David Stubbs is a London-based music journalist, uh, a former staff writer for The Melody Maker, um, and his work has appeared in a huge range of music and general publications, including the NME, The Wire, The Guardian, The Times, The Quietus, among many others. He's also the author of numerous books of, uh, on topics ranging from um, avant-garde music and our fear of it, and I might ask him a few things about that tonight, um, also a book on kraut rock, um, also quite recently a book on uh, Jimi Hendrix, Hendrix songs. Um, and tonight he's going to be reading from and talking about um, this book from 2018, uh, Mars by 1980, which is a fabulously detailed, capacious, beguiling, unexpectedly funny um, personal history of electronic music, um, which ranges across, I mean, I, I can't even mention all of the people who, who are touched upon here from, you know, the Futurist Manifesto through Stockhausen, through Sun Ra, through the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, um, Stevie Wonder, the Human League, Throbbing Gristle, the Apex Twin, um, and, and all of these drawn into this um, wonderfully kind of generous, uh, wide ranging history. So I'm gonna hand over to David now and ask him to read a little bit from the book uh, to give us a sense of it. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Right. Um, this is the sort of second part of the preface. It's titled One Summer. Um, I can only perhaps describe it. It was written in 2008 or published in 2018. And I suppose it's what notes, as it were, from the post-space age that I think that we're living in now, you might say, in various ways. Anyway, July 1977, Britain, a late Sunday afternoon. A dormitory village several miles from Leeds, a lane, a bedroom in an extension above a garage, a bedside table, a 15 year old boy on the bed, bedroom bound by adolescence, a boy holding a microphone connected to a cassette recorder next to a transistor radio, a fuzzy mono transistor radio with a soft grey speaker. Customarily, this radio sits in the kitchen, a crew in a coating of brown grease from the cooking fat billowing around the clock. Customarily, it's an instrument of oppression, broadcasting Wagoner's Walk, The Archers, Vince Hill, Sing Something Simple, all of which give the lie to the supersonic 70s, the sallow 50s more like. On a Sunday afternoon, there's nothing to do except homework to while away the hours until the velveteen Tom Brown presents the suspenseful Sunday chart show, the first breaking news of the hit parade in any week. This is too important to be broadcast solely on Radio 1 with its barely adequate interference adult signal, so for one hour a week only, there's pop on Radio 2 rather than the customary bow-tied crooners and Semprini serenade. Unfortunately, it's preceded by Charlie Chester and his Sunday soapbox, with a box full of records and a bag full of post, it's Radio Soapbox and Charlie's your host. It's impossible for a 15-year-old to make sense of. He's billed as cheerful Charlie, but it's cheerless fare indeed, like being obliged to look on an old uncle as he shows you his yellowing collection of World War II bobbins and cigarette cards with a threat of a slap on the head if you're not paying attention. These were the 1970s as lived, still coated with the dark brown war surplus paint, barely relieved. This was the context into which a new single crash landed like Skylab. 1976, Musicland Studio in Munich, home to the communes that gave rise to Amondul, but now host to an emerging disco factory. Among the musicians are Keith Forsey, a drummer who, like Cannes' Jackie Liebertsite, rejects the ostentatiousness of soloing in favour of the discipline of keeping time with thudding machine precision. There's Pete Ballot, a shy English expat, who is good at framing albums conceptually and at song structure. There's engineer Robbie Vadel, keeper of the secrets of the Moog synthesizer. Some of which, it turns out, are unknown even to Mr Moog himself. Finally, there's the Grand Master and Surveyor of the Mixing Desk, Giorgio Moroder. To the 15-year-old, his name speaks of sports cars, of aftershave cool, of suave, go-ahead European technique. 
Later, his moustache, hair and shades will make him look like a Eurodisco grotesque. But for now, he exists primarily in the 15-year-old's imagination. Motoric, mobile murderer. Finally, there's Donna Summer herself, an American ex-cast master, an American ex-cast member from the musical Hair, who will later refuse to limit herself as merely a disco singer, as well as unwisely alienate a vast segment of her audience when she gets religion and decides to condemn the gay lifestyle. For now, however, she's Donna Summer, wide-eyed, energetic, gossipy, full of love and fun, a gift from heaven. This team helped put together the epic, sensual, love to love you baby, but it was banned on release for its overt sexuality. The boy had no means of hearing it at the time, merely hearing about it. It was as mythical to the 15 year old as sex itself. This new track is an afterthought, an addendum to a concept album conceived by Bilot, an Anthony Powell-esque dance backwards and forwards through pop history and prehistory with the ironically nostalgic title of I Remember Yesterday. It's a showcase for Summer's immense versatility, harking back to 1940s swing, then the Motown era, then early 70s badass soul, then disco as constituted in the present day with Take Me, and then with I Feel Love, the tomorrow that was 1977. The track is built like a new car, the body first. Its apparently impossible electronic repetition and velocity is achieved by Vedel syncing two tracks in a way that feels superhuman. It's another feat of German ingenuity, following the composer Paul Hindemith's experiments in motoric music back in the 30s, the investigations of Herbert Eimert and Karlheinz Stockhausen, and later the inventions of Klaus Stinger, Ralph Hutter, Jackie Liebenscheid, and engineers like Kurt Grautner during the Krautrock era. So You Win Again by Hot Chocolate is at number one. The boy resents its fatalism, which seems to infect the pedestrian pace of the song. Mar Baker by Boney M is in there somewhere. Another West German confection. Emerson, Lake and Palmer have ballooned into the top 10 with fanfare for the common man, as corny an example of prog rock's pretensions to classical status as ever deigned to touch down in the charts. But snapping further back somewhere is pretty vacant. By the Sex Pistols, two new holes are being ripped in Pop's arse this week, and this is one of them. The other. Practically the moment it beams down, I feel love feels like first contact. The slow opening of the spacecraft door, the blinding shaft of green light. This is, what is this? Brian Eno hears it and rushes straight into David Bowie's studio, claiming he's beholding the future in his hand. Sparks hear it and promptly decide to ditch their band, hit up Maroda and functions an electronic duo. And that's just the start. What is this? Pure, silver, shimmering, arcing, perfectly puttering hover car brilliance. Space's magic fly to the power of ten. Seven inches have become twelve. Keyboards are played with unheard of bionic rotor blade capability. capability. It glides the way scissors do when you achieve the perfect synergy between mind, hand and blade, cutting through the dreary brown curtain of 1970s entertainment and revealing space. Space 1977. No exhaust, no vapor trails, no strings, no frills. This is takeoff. People will be left behind. People will be laid off. May you never hear rock music again. May you never hear light orchestra music again. May you never see happy days again. Meanwhile, Donna Summer's vocals fall like petals from robot heaven. The machine, threshing immaculately, owns this song. It's for her to glide diagonally around it, strewed with vocal grace, minimal subject matter. The words, I feel love, applied with a minimal, mild, synthetic treatment, sound like she's channeling the voice of machinery that has experienced an epiphany, like Star Trek's Lieutenant Commander Data discovering emotion. Except there is something coolly indifferent about this sonic craft, indifferent even to Donna Summer as it glides onwards and upwards, the minute after minute, powered on something far more durable than the mere human stamina. Even as the record fades away, you sense it is still out there, puttering pneumatically away, cruising at cirrus level. In 1973, the boy had received a five-year diary as a Christmas present. Licking forward through its empty pages, he reached as far away as 1977. Maybe it was the way the two sevens clashed, or maybe it was the chevron-like effect of the two numbers in conjunction. But as a year, it felt especially futuristic. What will life be like in 1977? 
Even decades later, the feeling somehow still holds. 1977 was Star Wars, Skylab, The Six Million Dollar Man, The Sex Pistols, Summer. The Apollo mission had closed a few years earlier, but no matter. Mars, Mars by 1980, surely. The boy was still growing, the world was still growing. Colour television had arrived only months earlier in the boy's household at any rate. And now electricity had arrived. The electricity would take us to uncharted space. I Feel Love felt like the launch of an exploratory mission, an advanced probe to delineate the decades that would take us to the 21st century, by which point the boy would be 37 years old with his whole life behind him. Decades later, the boy would still ask himself, what will life be like in the year 1977? Well, thank you. Um, I, I want to note before we continue quite how timely this event is, given that um, we didn't get on Mars by 1980, but um, we have landed on something on NASA has landed something on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's yes, absolutely. I mean, I was just thinking that, although I think the images that is brought back are pretty familiar ones that have been familiar for decades. I mean, I think obviously they were thinking of actually people, you know, going out into, you know, like a total recall type scenario by now. And, um, and I suppose for me, the space program stalling the way it is, is a sort of metaphor for the way ideas of the ever expanding future stalled at a certain point. And we entered this kind of strange sort of postmodern era. And there was a triumph in a sense of the ubiquity of electronic music, but that was something that became rather awkward. For instance, Kraftwerk by 1986 effectively stopped recording new material. They made the album Electric Cafe. And since then, they've only they've, they've barely recorded anything new, um, really because their work was done. Um, they were always the great harbingers of the industrial, new, technical, electronic sound. But then, you know, Bruce Springsteen's using synthesizers by 1986, you know, and it's, it's, it's just interesting, you know, that, that um, and, then, and then obviously in the later era of rave or whatever, um, electronic music achieves another kind of ubiquity. It kind of, uh, it, it replaces the sort of late 60s hippie, hippie-ish sense of like all of us together in the field, which I think people have been pining for, for a decade perhaps, you know, because in that sort of, during the 70s with punk and through the 80s, things were very tribal and very fractious. Suddenly there was this tremendous need for unity. Um, and that unity wasn't provided by kind of guitar heroes anymore standing on stage or whatever. It wasn't, you know, Jimi Hendrix or Jeff Beck or Eric Clapton mm -hmm. as, as the great channelers of this new spirit. It was, you know, like DJs um, and it was anonymous and it was, you know, it was reflected in, in, in beats rather than guitar solos. Um, and I suppose, those are the kind of broad, I'm taking a very aerial perspective, I suppose, in this book of, you know, the nature of electronic music. It's, it's, um, I'm not, I'm not at all techie. I can't even change a plug. And it's not really from the point of view of like production of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. electronic music, the machinery of it. Um, I'm more interested in, in a sense, the meaning of electronic music, you know, how it landed on the other side of the wall, as it were, how it impacted in the world, what it meant, why it happened the way it did when it did. Yeah, and that cosmic dimension is mm. um, what it represents here, I suppose, is it's this idea of the future, as you say, and and a kind of utopianism. And I mean, in this sense, is something yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was there in your book and it's there in Julia's piece as well, which is that electronic music holds out that possibility of, of something, yeah. some sort of place, yeah. some possible future. Um, hmm. And I mean, it holds out much darker things as well. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But it, it, it's extra human rather than inhuman, which is obviously the initial objection level, you know, when it first emerged, uh, inauthentic, inhuman. It's extra human. And I think that a lot of the pioneers, that people like Sun Ra and Stockhouse and whatever, really realised that. For them, it represented a harbinger of, you know, the expansion of sound and the possibility of sound was like an expansion of human potential, human ideas. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that my... But I think there's lots of interesting things that emerge out of this, and particularly from also from reading your book. I think the first thing is the argument that you make, which is also an argument that I feel very strongly, which is the sort of sandbank that music has ploughed itself into at the moment hmm. in relation to, to electronic music just being driven by algorithms. And I'm very, very guilty of this because I'm a SoundCloud addict and I listen hmm. to mixes on SoundCloud and they'll be there in the background while I'm working. And then I realise that the algorithm has been picking the music for me. I'm not choosing it. And there isn't that sense of self-directed interest in music, which I really used to have as a teenager and which I was 
you know, the, 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 what, what you described really well, the, getting the record 12 inch, having it, listening to it to death until it was scratched to buggery. There was that mm -hmm. sense of really investing in it as a physical object and also as the kind of potential for something amazing to happen if you have these things in your record collection, apart from just being cool, it transported you somewhere. Um, and I feel very much that, and, and then added to that, the way that technology, not just this, in the selection of music, so the way that the algorithms choose the music for us, but also the kind of pitch and tone of that music. So the use of auto-tune, the way that it's, con the way that a lot of it seems constructed in a very particular way. There's so much of that horrible EDM mm. stuff in the charts all the time. You can see the kind of cynical structures of the songs are designed in, in very specific ways to have a particular effect. And yeah. there's definitely a sort of sense of, I wonder what, and, and new things, the new sounds. I mean, I try to listen to uh, as much as I can when I'm being self-directed to things, listen to things on Rinse FM and whatever. And a lot of it seems really angry and fractured. Lots of it is cut up and, mm. and cross. And there's, there's a really sort of interesting stuff happening there, but there doesn't seem to be that much new. I'm like, where's the, there was always this sense in music that every, every five minutes there would be something, every five years, every, every 10 years, there'd be something new. As I feel like the electronic music, the sound of the machines has almost reached this place of impasse, which I feel that has happened yeah. as well in the internet. Yeah, I and mean, I think, yeah, there's obviously a vast mushroom of activity, which I think you get in a lot of sort of, you know, cultural places or whatever. And again, when I was referring to the post space age, I think space is almost the idea of scarcity as well. That you know, you really when something new happened and it sort of made you know, and it made an impact. So you you know, really fastened onto it, and in a sense, the scarcity obviously in a sense added to its value. Um, but in a funny kind of way, I guess that's still the way today. Really, I mean, it's even now amid you know, like you say, you know, there's this vast algorithmically generated activity. It's still only now, every now and again, I'll, I'll hit on some particular tune or some particular thing that I'll then play 30 or 40 times. And it still sometimes feels there's a sort of, you know, like, you know, the needle in the haystack thing to find the occasional tune that really does give you the absolute lift, you know. Yeah, but there was something about that. But also there's something for me, and maybe, and again, you know, one is looking at these things through rose-tinted nostalgic spectacles, but Birmingham in the, in the, in the early 90s, which was really my... Uh, early youth and hanging out with people like Tony Childs, who's the DJ, DJ the surgeon, um, who went on to be hugely famous and successful. It, it felt like you could listen to music that actually was going to piss off the government. You know, the, the, mm. the repetitive beats, the, the yeah. Michael Howard's thing. You could go to Castle Mortem, which I didn't. I wish I could have said I went to it, but all my friends went because it happened a week before my final <laughs> exams and there was no way that I was going to. I just I so wanted to go. Um, and there was something really interesting about the sense that the music itself was, it was edgy, it was, it was coming from the outside. It wasn't something that was kind of assimilated into the culture. And I still get that feeling a bit in, in Berlin, as you can tell from the essay about Bergheim, that there, is, there was still very much a sense that it's outside the mainstream. It's not something that's uh, being broadcast on, you know. All I, 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 I love the paradox in a sense that it's kind of, inclusionary in a sense you know in terms of the sort of the queerness that you talk about which isn't just you know about gender but exclusionary in a, at the same time you know it's it it, it 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 it's it's both you know i think you know that's a that's a fascinating thing and uh, you know, the very sense yeah you're absolutely right i mean i think with um you know carson morton it was probably the last time one of the very few times where music has as you say been at odds with the government that, that, that legislation was actually introduced in an attempt to counter this in terms of like right now i was just wondering i mean to be honest, my personal my raving days never really got started that 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 much. But um, but you hit me about the fact that like clubs have been closed down, that it's much much more difficult to get clubs going, and you just wonder if there's going to be this kind of rise of um, illicit raves, you know, that, that happen, you know, in sort of um, you know, unauthorized spaces. Um, if that's, I mean, it's possible. That, I mean, obviously, there's the whole thing of like plague. DJing stuff like that and people organizing mm. things under th which is a bit dubious but above and beyond that you know in the future that um that, that obviously there was the commercialization of clubs you know in the 90s but and past and beyond that people do want that experience but they have to experience it in a you know in a similar spirit to the way they had to do it in back in 88 89. I think it was really connected to the economy because I think look looking back at Birmingham at that time I mean it was completely decimated by the deindustrialization of the West Midlands there were loads of empty warehouses all over the place it was like Berlin in that sense it had lots of space that we could occupy people could occupy take over run a nightclub somebody could bring a sound system 
I mean, that doesn't exist anymore. All those places have become, you know, uh, burger bars and, and you know, yeah. fancy, fancy wine bars and whatever, the sort of physical gentrification of Birmingham that, that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s just completely obliterated a lot of that. And I think Berlin's been going through a similar kind of issue. Um, and then obviously now we're in this this weird sort of empty space of COVID and not quite knowing what's going to come out of that or what will still emerge from that. I think if there's a massive recession, then maybe there will be all those spaces will come back. There'll be lots of empty office spaces that people can occupy again. I yeah, have, I mean, this, I, this is it, you know. Yeah, you know, spaces may, yet, you know, re-emerge and, and things are, you know, activities are actually happening somewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, that might... Um, I mean, that'd be something of the future. I loved your description actually when you were talking about being in the club and you know and the, and the impacting of you know of techno and everything like that and the way it kind of transported you and you were you were there but you weren't there etc cetera, etc cetera. and and the power that but then also you know as you've been saying recently that the, the feeling that maybe the machinery has kind of come to a sort of terminus and it was interesting you know, that if there were certain forms like industrial music or whatever. Um, which you know was kind of sort of proto techno and um, sort of strong, rigid, harsh, masculine, and I found that that's the kind of music that hasn't really is perhaps a victim of its own rigidity in a sense, and hasn't quite stood the test of time. I noticed that people are, that are into those music they are almost like a kind of a time capsule of a certain point in the nineteen eighties, and I think that like you know, techno is best when in, there's, there's an element of sort of of breakdown of fluidity i mean sophie i just thought was absolutely you know brilliant mm. in respect and she's such a loss because her the way that she made music was kind of a metaphor for you know her and the idea of like you know of things like queerness and becoming which i think is kind of an important thing you know you're not just you you, you can you can become potentially mm. you know and her music was a metaphor for that and, and obviously the way that she kind of used auto tune or whatever and um you know, there, and you know, and I think that fluidity is a really important aspect of, the, of, the, of that. Yeah, no, I would agree. Sorry, Kay, I feel like I've, I haven't answered a question. <laughs> you had a question. If you had a question, I was going to ask. I was going to ask you, Julia, to say a bit more about how the really techno essay came about, um, because it's. I mean, you read as bits of it, but there's quite a lot going on in that essay. I think as a, a kind of um, where it's it's. You know, there's an autobiographical element, there's um, the music and the space are very important, I suppose, in working through um, grief, actually, mm. in that, that piece. Um, and, and there's also, but there, there's also, there are also reflections on, you know, things like the technology, the speaker system that Berkheim has, and as well as the kinds of communities that it fosters, I think. Um, and, and, and I suppose, and almost, also complicating that idea of community of being with people but also separate somehow um so could you say a little bit about the the, the origins of that piece? yeah well the essay was was really because a friend of mine died very suddenly and unexpectedly from a brain tumor and i'd been to see him in the hospital before they switched off the machines and the machines sounded like the techno they were beeping in the background and there he was in the hospital with brain dead and it was really very shocking and upsetting and um, he was still very young. And I think that the, it Berghain, I went to Berghain to kind of memorialize him, I suppose, to go and, and have a dance on my own <laughs> and be sad about it because not that many people I knew knew him, um, but I knew him from the UK. So yeah, um, so there was that behind it, I think, as a, as a sort of motivation for, for wanting to think about it and write about it. And then I also think for me, actually going to a club and dancing has never been a particularly sociable experience. I love dancing in a crowd of people, of strangers. I love it. I just love the, of being able to let go, not worrying about, you know, who's holding whose handbag or having to worry about my friends or, you know, whether they want to go home or who's having a drama. I can just be in the middle of the dance floor with the music. If it's a really good DJ and lose myself for a couple of hours. And it's just, that's, that to me is kind of fantastic and it's totally antisocial, but I also think it's social in a, I think the, the Greeks have a word for it, it's sort of ludic in a way. It has that kind of way of being present but with other people and acknowledging one's connection to other people whilst also being on your own. And I also think a lot of other people enjoy that. I know that. I know that from being on the dance floor at Berghain and seeing the same faces <laughs> who've been there since they got there and they're still on. I'm some Irish guy. I've been on the dance floor for two days. I mean, yeah, you have. You know, <laughs> That was why he went. <laughs> that was the point. And, and also that sort of 
I don't know, there's something about the bacchanal, about letting go, about being in a space where um, anything is possible, which I think is really exciting. Um, and also something that one can still enjoy, the, the, the sort of sense that, that I think, like I said in the piece that I read, the frustration of being expected to sort of dance to some Nile Rodgers. I remember went to, um, I actually remember going to Trestle with, um, in 2014, I think it was, and being chased around the club by this young boy. He was like, how old are you? How old are you? Why are you here? And I was just like, oh, fuck off. Why can't I be here? And I never had that problem in Burkhan. Nobody ever asked. Nobody, there were plenty of people my age. Everybody was older. Nobody cared. It didn't matter. It was just everybody was there because they were there and they were having a good time and everybody had been let in. So by being let in, they all felt that they were in somehow in, in, in a sort of separated special place. And I think that was so important as well for queer people to feel that the club wasn't just about to be colonised by a, a bunch of, you know, a bit like some of the, the clubs in Ibiza and whatnot got colonised by particular groups of people or by commerce, I suppose, really, in the end, by by money. It, it, people are really there for, genuinely because they love the music and they love the, the sort of the environment of each other, the vibe of each other. It's safe. Mm. Yeah, well, I think, and I think, the, but also the, it's not just that, that issue, age not being an issue, but also, uh, and this being some, uh, a space where it's sort of the possible and permissible. Um, but, but there's also, and this is something we could come back to, this, this kind of being present idea, this attentiveness in a way that, yes. the way that you talk about this, which, which might seem paradoxical because of course, you know, I think we have the idea that you go out dancing, particularly to a club like Bergheim, and it's a kind of escapism, and it is in some sense, but it's also, and this is, I think, where the, the sense of this is, a, you know, as a kind of elegy, um, this piece, um, a really beautiful piece in that way. Um, it's, a, it's about sort of being present with something and, um, and yes. facilitates that. Um, well, the music is, is physiological at that point. At that, at that sound, at that, I mean, it, at that pitch, it's so loud. It goes right through your body. The sound waves move through your body, which I always think is an amazingly cosmic thing to actually really physically understand. And then add that to the to the lights and to the to the and you know and all the tricks the DJs pull, giving you the longest possible breaks before bringing the bass back in. All of those sort of moments where they can generate a certain kind of euphoria, but done on a done on such an industrial scale with those amazing speakers. So nothing sounded tinny. Nothing sounded like it was. It, you know, the, the music was really, it's really crisp in Bergheim. It's such a lovely, lovely sound to having, you know, tolerated the most appalling sound systems everywhere. There's just something very special about that sound system when you're in the right place. It really just moves through you. It's, it, it, so it is a physiological experience. It's, it's something precious about Berlin. I think I always feel it is like the last outpost in the world. And I think that everybody was, everywhere else was getting kind of gentrified and, you know, club spaces or whatever, or cultural spaces were being sort of marginalised to the point of extinction or whatever. But you always feel in terms of rent and in terms of availability and in terms of things happening that Berlin, you know, maybe hopefully it still is perhaps in some way, but was, was at least holding out, you know, and, I don't know, but I always have a slightly psychogeographic thing. I love Berlin. You know, I don't think it's necessarily the most beautiful place in the world, but, you know, the, the, the palpable sense of history. I was there when Christo wrapped the Reichstag, and that was an astonishing, you know, event. There's perhaps a sort of cultural history, the fact that, you know, going back in the 60s, people, um, like Conrad Schnitzler, when they founded the, um, um, the Zodiac for the Arts Lab, and it was a kind of antidote to the whole hippie thing. It was very binary, it was black and white, very brutalist, which was the whole aesthetic that he kind of brought. And I always think of that as perhaps being a sort of a precursor, a sort of a germ of a notion of what was going to happen in Berlin. Um, well, I, um, I, everything I, love I, right. I, I was going to ask you about the importance of Germany in the history of electronic music, because it's it's such a thread that runs through the book. And, and, mm. um, and obviously the, the previous book on, on Krautrock. And I, I wondered if you had a... A kind of theory of why it is that that German bands and musicians and composers have have played this kind of role, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a sense, it does actually perhaps go right back to a sort of music on like like Stockhausen and its reaction to the Second World War and its reaction to the ruins of the Second World War. The fact that like culture was kind of you know brutally cleaved, you know, by the Nazis, and they had to. It, and so initially, I think Stockhausen kind of responds by trying to create this kind of 
clean, pure electronic music that is not a part of this terrible fallen world where you see them dreadful things as an ambulance driver and stuff like that. He's lost his parents or whatever. And I think he also wants to kind of escape into this whole new tabula rasa, this new realm. But then later on, I think with the electronic musicians of the late 1960s, I mean, electronic, they weren't all electronic, but they did have recourse to electronics or in modifying their instruments electronically. It was a generation that was the May 68 generation. They, they, they were in Germany, had a particular, West Germany had a particular resonance. These were a generation just coming of age and realizing, as you do at that age, you know, the enormity of like their country's history, finding out properly about, you know, the, the, you know, the Third Reich, about the Holocaust, and, you know, and, and then go, perhaps going back and saying to their family, you know, you didn't mention anything about this, granddad, father. <laughs> you didn't mention that. And the fact that, like, what they call out Nazis, you know, these were people that were still running things in the country. And I think that kind of awareness was pretty much pretty shocking across the board. And then I think there was a sort of sense among musicians, or, or at least a handful of musicians, that they needed to kind of reassume, reinvent a sense of Germ German identity. Kraftwerk, an example, all of the records are products of West Germany. They wanted to make it clear that they were kind of a clean break with it were the sort of cultural martial plan of Anglo-American beat music, whether it's the Beatles, Motown or whatever. And a lot of musicians in West Germany in the 60s were making a living just sort of aping, you know, those those, those styles. And it was almost a case, you know, we're the nation of like um, Hindemith, we're the nation of Bauhaus or whatever. And, and, and therefore it became about inventing new forms um, became very, very important and taking kind of very futuristic tack. And so, you know, you get that in Neu in the sort of motoring beat, you get it in um, Faust in their sort of Dardis type collages. And of course you get it in Kraftwerk who are making a music that is essentially applying Bauhaus philosophy, you know, art and function or whatever, serenely melded. Um, so I think, yeah, it's very much to do with that. And I think, you, you know, it's no coincidence, it's happening in Berlin, it's happening in Hamburg, it's happening in Dusseldorf, Cologne with Cannes, and it's happening, you know, it's in a very diverse range of artists all having the same response. We've got to start from scratch, we've got to begin again. And of course, that's a tremendous bequest to the future because all the people are still drawing on the kind of new forms that were a kind of, repost really to what was going on the, the rather dull leaden plot 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 prog rock you know that was um dominating in the late 60s early 70s and the whole anglo-american scene i mean you know this was real invention and the post-punk generation were the first to kick in you know, click into it and then that the later inspired people like daf and neue deutsche Welle, whatever where it became kind of more intensely rhythmic so I, you know i just think that sense of constructing anew is very very important and i think it's foundational yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, it's maybe then no surprise that it comes so often out of a country that is, is reflecting quite starkly and honestly on its recent history and so yeah, on. And yeah, like, as opposed to Britpop, which is like retrograde, triumphalist, yeah. concerned. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can trust Krautrock with Britpop and they're completely antithetical in every way. You know, one is about kind of invention, it's about a sort of tacit acknowledgement of terrible history and, and Britpop is Britpop. <laughs> But I think I'd like to, to I, I, I suppose for me, it was also Detroit that was the thing that really, I mean, yeah, the, the German craft work and so on was important. But for me, the, the stuff that came out of the Derek May stuff, you know, the, the, the craft work in an elevator with George Clinton, I think, is the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the sort of mashup between that kind of rigid, ordered beat structure and then and then jazz on top of it. I love that. I just love it. I just love the way that it mashes those things together and then makes something entirely different and also for me that it seemed to describe post-industrial spaces and I suppose that was mm. also to do with Birmingham being very particularly post-industrial and also the music that Surgeon was making at the time and then uh, they were doing a night called the House of God which was going around Birmingham and then went to Berlin I think at various points there was this really interesting connection between those three cities for me in terms of the sort of post-industrial at the at, in the 90s in that in that sort of post-industrial the warehouse spaces the music that was being made to, to fill those spaces absolutely i mean it is ironic really to think of like you know that, that music is going hammer and tongs it's almost like kind of ripping you know the ghosts of the actual mechanical activity that went on in mm, Detroit, mm. you know in the manufacture of the absolutely whatever. it's uh, but also i think in terms of detroit and I always think of like the African American response to Kraftwerk, which people just thought was just like the most bizarre and improbable thing because, you know, the contrast between a figure like Ralph Butter and, and Derek May or whatever. But there's an, there's an obvious, to me, 
there's always been much more of a kind of embrace of electronic music within black communities, African-American, black, British. And for me, I think it's, and, and white audiences, by contrast, do tend towards the conservative um, pop wise. You know, there are a lot of sort of retro I think, about white audiences. They, they, they're more comfy with the past than they are the present or the future. Whereas I was thinking, if you're, if you're black, then you're not really thinking, oh, the 50s were great, weren't they? Oh, the 60s, they were fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, they weren't. There they were, they were times of like terrible associations of sort of oppression and, and civil rights struggle and what have you. And the present isn't that great either, but the future, maybe. And I think that electronic music does have that kind of signification. I think there's where a lot more enthusiasm, a lot more invention, you know, electronically within black communities uh, for that reason. Well, I think that's a, certainly a strong, a strong aspect of the appeal. I want to ask both of you about what kind of challenges there were with writing, using a linguistic medium to try and express or explore music. And because David, in your book, there are, there are some great passages here, which I, I almost think of as experimental writing, where particularly where you're, there's a passage where you're talking about Stockhausen, for example, and, um, and you're sort of describing what the music is doing and it becomes almost this, this sort of stream of consciousness where you're, you're both describing the sounds but also describing the feeling of the sounds and so on. So it's, you have to kind of break the sentences up to make that work. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, and Julia as well, I, I suppose in, in, you kind of bring us back to the body so much in that piece as a way of trying to, there's, there's sort of only so far you can go in describing what, the sounds are and mm. it's it becomes partly about describing the feeling and the senses and this sort of return to the body so yeah as, sort of as writers <laughs> what were the what were the challenges in trying to I think uh, it was quite it was hard I mean but I also think the way I went about it was also to try and think about actually what was happening to my body in that space because I think I was curious about that too I wanted to think about it in terms of well why do I like this so much it was always one of those sort of pleasures illicit pleasures you know every now and then go out dancing or go to a go to a party or you know rave or something um what is it about this particular pleasure that's so pleasurable why am I enjoying this so much and really sort of thinking about the sound system and the way the sound system affects the body and thinking about the particular kinds of music that was being played and also just the cathedral like experience of being in such an enormous space with such a loud sound system I mean it is designed to physically overwhelm you that's the point um, and, and trying to put that, that, I guess that's what I was trying to get across. I think you can never get across the sound because you have to listen to it. It's really difficult. It's like describing taste. It's really hard yeah. to actually to nail that. So I'm never going to get that music, the, the, the rhythm of the music down unless I start writing poetry. So, yeah, mm. there's always going to be a limit to that. I think the why word is really important. Why grass, get, you know, try and sort of illuminate a significance, uh, you know, that is really important. But also, I suppose there's the how and the what. And um, you were talking about those passages from Stockhausen. And it is, yes, it is an attempt to sort of verbally transcribe the experience, um, even though music, you know, is, is essentially abstract. Um, and I just think it was something that the materiality of sound, I suppose, as a rock writer, when I was starting out, I just felt that it was something that people were kind of evading really in rock writing because they didn't really they perhaps felt they felt, they felt it was too indulgent to write in that way or to kind of grant the materiality of sound and the physical effect of it so people weren't really doing it and sometimes the language could be a bit impoverished you know in rock journalism and so I think that was one of the things that I was trying to do but it was important not just to make it a kind of a sort of you know menu description or whatever where you know you're just trying to describe you know, um fondue or whatever that, that it was <laughs> that, that, that it had to be that significance you know but this this record is for this reason you know this there was an important thing going on you know beneath all these kind of wonderful effects and things like that and and it's to do with and it's to do with surface the significance of surface as well i suppose is something else i was getting because that's another thing as a writer and especially someone who studied english literature that was another thing that people people just attended entirely to lyrics and the meaning of lyrics mm -hmm. and i was never massively interested in that i was always interested in the overall impact you know the feel of thing you know the texture as well as the text um sometimes disregarding the text altogether you know the physical uh, impact of a piece of music i sometimes felt was far more mm. interesting than lyrics which, which sometimes were just a little bit try and not particularly impressive as standalone you know phenomena but i sometimes felt that people sometimes attended to lyrics or over attended to artists who were primarily lyricists and 
promoted them as the most important artists, even though sometimes their music was a little bit threadbare or functionary as far as I was concerned. Um, but I mean, and I, and I think there was actually criticism was made of one of the writers like me that you could sort of sometimes make music that was actually fairly ordinary, sound extraordinary, <laughs> but, by, by overwriting, you know, by, by being over effusive in the way you're writing, you know, you, you wrote about it. I mean, there's always, there's actually that danger as well, um, over elevating music. Yeah, though I think you're very you're very generous in the book because there's a, the passages where you're talking about the Pet Shop Boys, for example, and you say that you were never particularly keen on them, actually. No. And so what you do, I think, really nicely is you ask two people you know who yeah, you know, yeah. were big fans of them to say, well, what is it about them? Yeah, yeah. And that, that sort of openness to the experiences that other people might have had of music that hasn't quite, you know, reached you or affected That's you. Right. I mean, I, you know, I, I appreciate their kind of importance you know, retrospectively at the time when I was writing about them, I just didn't, I didn't really get it. But so, yeah, I thought, you know, an insistence and yeah, get, yeah, contract it out, get someone else in to <laughs> do that bit. Um, I want to, I want to segue slightly awkwardly into, I suppose, to thinking about where you end up in the book, David, and also thinking about um, Julia's recent book, Radical Attention, thinking about the question of the internet and the effect mm. that this has had on our well, on, on the kind of music that's being produced and disseminated and the ways in which we consume music. And um, of course, right now in, you know, with um, gig venues and bars and clubs and so on being closed, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, a really, it's a really important resource, I suppose, the internet. And, and it seems to me, David, you, end, you, you wind up in this book in a place where on the one hand, you say that the internet has liberated electronic mm. music and given us access to this just, you know, incredible range of material and artists. And you, you go on to, you know, to sort of um, spotlight some that, uh, that you think are, are doing really great things now, some great musicians. But, um, but there's also a real, there is a kind of, there's an obvious unease or anxiety about the, the effects of living in an internet age that, that mm. comes through the book, I think, and, and, and a sort of reinforce, reinforcement of the importance of the analogue, for example. So I was going to ask you about that as, and, and also then to ask Julia to say a little bit about radical attention and, and maybe lead into reading something from that, Julia. Um, just in, yeah, as a, as a way of thinking about how the, the story of electronic music develops, I suppose, mm. with the the internet. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that um, electronic music becomes the more appropriate soundtrack to the kind of era that we're living in, you know, the digital era or whatever. Um, um, the internet, given that I live on the internet, I probably wish it hadn't been invented. <laughs> I'm one of these people, something I want the 20th century back. Um, I mean, it's obviously had a kind of, it's had a negative economic impact in various ways. I mean, I know lots of people, whether I was talking to people like DJ Shadow, and he said, yeah, I earned loads more in the 1990s. And I said, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, clearly, you know, it's, it's affected the general economy of music making. I mean, there's been a great mushrooming of activity, though, of course. And, and it's not that just there's so much music being made. There's so much good music being made. But in a sense, it's more than the market can bear. Mm. And it's almost like in a just world, probably all these people give everybody a thousand pounds each because there's so many people that they deserve, you know, given the amount of money that there is in terms of disposable, global disposable income to spend on, 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 on music. Um, sometimes people feel that who said that there's nothing happening in a sense that there's nothing central, you know, there's a loss of centrality, I guess. I mean, which is possibly something that was going on for a while anyway, even that was something I sort of sensed even in the 1990s, the, gradual mushrooming up to the, to the sort of fragmentary nature. And as a paradox, I think that's what creates phenomena like anything like Oasis to a Delta Ed Shoe and people who seem to not be that particularly extraordinary, but um, command a massive share of the commercial pie because other people want common talking points, Coldplay or whatever, you know, common selling points. And it's very, very hard. I mean, I always used to get people saying, so what's the next thing that I should be listening to? It was never things, it was thing. It was always singular <laughs> because people just want to know what, you know, the, the Beatles type thing or the Sex Beatles type thing might be. And, you know, I never have an answer. I just read off 20 things and their eyes would glaze over. Their eyes and ears would glaze over. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very complicated time. At the same time, as I say, I do sometimes feel like scarcity. It's still hard. And there's this paralysis as well of like there being so much 
potentially available, you know, on just some Bandcamp, SoundCloud. I do try and buy music. I have to make a conscious effort to buy music and just put a few quid in people's pockets. But you could just listen to it for nothing. And that sense of everything just being on tap like that, I think is you lose something. I feel you lose something precious there. And I think anybody that was sort of growing up in the late 20th century and buying music remembers what it used to be like and perhaps regrets the passing of that. Yeah, I think vinyl music has um, come back, though. There's been a huge yeah. revival in people buying buying vinyl, I think because the material object becomes yes. so important in this yeah. weird sort of place that we're in where everything becomes so diffuse. I mean, I don't know. I'm more... Skeptical, cynical, worried, I suppose, because I do think that the, the the issue also is commercial and the way in which musicians now have to make money from touring and they won't necessarily make money from downloads or from from definitely not from um, Spotify or whatever. Um, and and the way that it sucked the life, the lifestyle maybe, but also the, the, the possibility of making a living from music from a lot of people. Um, and I think that's really dangerous because we end up in a very sort of monocultural situation where the algorithms, I mean, the music is being generated by the machine and then fed to us uh, by the algorithm. And actually there isn't very little human interaction in between. You know, you just press a, press a sort of code on your synthesizer and it'll create a kind of sound that will be like the last thing you listen to. And in fact, I think on, on Spotify, there are some actual songs that are like that, that have been created by Spotify algorithms. They aren't even proper songs. And I think that that, that sort of slippage um, is one of the things I'm kind of concerned about, I think. And one of the reasons why I wrote this, um, yeah. which was a follow up. It wasn't really a follow up to the Berghain essay, although that was one of the things I wrote another essay that um, about an experience of an interview at Oxford that I had that was that was horrendous. And it went really went it went viral. I mean, it was I was it was extraordinary. I just I've spent several weeks just dealing with Twitter and emails and so on. And it was nice to get attention, but it was too much attention. It was like it went. It, I couldn't control it. It went from you know lots of people going way well done to too many people contacting me wanting to talk to me to the point where I was completely overwhelmed by it. And I think that that is the flip side of of us being connected to everybody else is that it's the it's the scale of it can become astronomical very very fast yeah. and in, in a very vertiginous kind of way um and i think that that's true across a lot of art forms and you can't really i don't know you can see people trying to game the algorithms too to to, to get their hit or their song or their music out there um but it does feel like this it's an era of weird stagnation and i wonder whether or not if we are hit by a very bad recession which i think we probably will be whether or not that might be quite good for creativity, because I sort of feel that periods of that periods like that are often regenerative. They force people yeah. to be creative about about making new things and new spaces. Um, but at the moment, it feels very much like culture has been hijacked by it's been hijacked by the algorithms, the way we socialize with each other, the way we the way we listen to music, watch films, digest TV series, and so on. I mean, even Netflix shows now feel very much like they've been designed by algorithm rather than by committee. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them, somebody even said that Emily in Paris was a program that, I, which I haven't seen, but was designed for, to be watched with the phone in your hand. It was a TV series that was designed for people who were watching TV, but also scrolling through their phone at the same time. So there was an, in, there was, every episode is pretty much the same. Lots of blank space very little happens, a few sorts of wish fulfillment things about being in Paris and then everybody can scroll through their phone while they're watching this TV in the background. So it's like TV background noise. And I feel like that's happened with music as well. I think that, yeah, yeah I think so. But in a sense, perhaps that's a replacement for the kind of cultural emptiness that I was like describing in my little extract earlier on, you know, the complete alienation of Vince Hill and all that Radio 2 music that was clearly for an old yes. song that just left me completely alienated and cold. And it's just that there's this constant sort of, um, you know, static of, um, of, of, like you say, all these kind of Netflix things, all these kind of options and choices, and, and still, you know, the, the thing that's really good, you know, that's in there somewhere, if you can find it, is still is, is still an elusive thing, I guess. But uh, um, 
but yes, it is, it is, it is complicated times. And again, in terms of the recession, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, in the eighties, you could really track it like the early eighties recession, really, you know, post-punk, whatever. Then as things get, start to get a bit more prosperous, it's stock ache in the water. And then, then in the early nineties, there's a little mini recession and then music, you know, it's radio ahead and Margaret Valentine, everything like that. And the economy picks up and it's Oasis. Um, <laughs> it really seems to be a very strong correlation that you point out. Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, I wonder if as well with the internet, it's not with the, the, the algorithms and the kind of overabundance of staff, much of it heavily commercialized. But it's and it's also really a kind of over connectivity that leads to a disconnection. From, yes. From places. I mean, so much of what you've been saying about electronic music is about the particular, you know, often industrial and post-industrial urban environments, you know, out of which it springs and which it kind of expresses and Know, and where the parties happen and where the clubs spring up. And, and so there's this sort of weird um, flattening that happens, I think, with, with mm. so much of our social life and our cultural life happening online. I mean, if, yes. Of course, it's, it's, at the moment. Yeah. it's also what makes it really hard to remember because, because so much of it is, is kind of done on screen. Everything looks the same. Should I read two paragraphs from this just quickly? Yes, read something from that. And David, I was going to invite you, I think, I think we just sure, have yeah. time, to read something short. And just to remind uh, anybody present who wants to put questions in the chat, do. Um, I have a couple of questions that have been texted to me, which I can also read you at the end. So, uh, Julia. Um, a smartphone screen is capacitive, which means it responds to the conductive power of the human body which is why it can't work with fingernails or gloves. A metal coating on the glass creates an electrical field, which is interrupted by touch. When I take my broken screen to the shop to get it fixed, the man who takes my money offers me three different kinds of screen. The cheapest, which is the one I pay for, has come from China. He reassures me that it's just as good as the official Apple ones, which are made in Europe. He shows me the screens. They all look the same. The broken screen has been cutting the tips of my fingers for weeks. While I wait for him to fix the screen under a bright craft lamp, I go for a coffee next door, worrying the jagged bits of skin on my thumbs. Usually I would sit here and browse through my phone. Now I feel naked and bored. I, slip my I sip my flat white and wonder about the fact that my body is a conduit for electricity. The word screen is both a noun and a verb, a shield, protection, an ornamental feature, a protective formation of troops, ships or planes, a site of projection, a means of obscuring or hiding something, a barrier, a boundary, a disguise, a system for sorting, for examining components, for separating wheat from chaff, for sifting soil, a barrier to insects, a preserver of modesty, a symbol of power. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, David, um, I don't, do you want to read from something new? Do you want to tell us what you're working on now? Because, of course. <laughs> well, oddly, odd, oddly enough, I'm working on, I mean, I'm doing various things that are kind of vaguely electronic related, but the nature of things are they're a little bit hush hush. I'm not really supposed to divulge them, you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> but what I have, oddly enough, my follow up to Mars Bar 1980 is also a favourite, a sort of history of British comedy. Um, in a sense, I'm giving it the sort of Mars Bar 80 cultural treatment, except it's Tommy Cooper instead of Stockhausen, you know, it's, it's, um, but it's, um, but there are odd um, overlaps. Um, so I'll just read a couple of things just sort of explain. For instance, Spike Milligan, I think is a bit of a distinctly problematic character in many ways. However, I do think that his, you know, his innovative role in post-war is, it's, um, um, it's quite, you know, there's, 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 there's parallels really with um, um, what was happening at the same time in electronic music. I'll just read a little, it's a very short extract. The comedy developed by the goons was the sort of cynical in jokery which young men often develop to cope with interments of various kinds, be it wage slavery, an office, school, or service for king and country. With Milligan and Co., it's not too far fetched to say that it formed a significant part of the post war avant garde in which the ruins of war were a metaphor for the explosion of old artistic forms and assumptions. In theatre, this manifested itself in the theatre of the absurd, which carried through ideas developed by the existentialists and the Dadaists, who had a similar reaction to the events of World War I. In music, it found expression in electronics and music concrete, as developed by Karl Heinz Stockhausen and Pierre Schaeffer, respectively, using or repurposing new technologies to create music that in its sources 
expansive abstraction and departures from the pen and ink constrictions of conventional notions visualise new realms for contemporary music. Not that Milligan was a fan of electronic music, which he equated with the Muzak, which he regarded as a blight on the modern world. He hated extraneous noise, and towards the end of his life he had to drink a bottle of wine a day just to alleviate the stress of the peripheral noise of a motorway a mile away from his house. However, he was fully conscious of the way he could use the studio and radio to realise his impossibly surreal comic ideas, take liberties with space and time. Milligan was very keen, for example, on availing of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, commissioning them, for example, to create the noise of major blood knock stomach and its consequent flatulence, as well as the effects in the Scarlet Capsule, a parody of Quatermass and the Pit. He might well have used it more had Desmond Briscoe, organiser of the Radiophonic Workshop, declared firmly, I don't want Mr Milligan living here. Mm -hmm. Who knows what kind of Hirschfield the goons might have become if it weren't for this injunction. So that was just one little bit. The second little bit, it's just, it's, again, a short, it's about electronic music and humour. And um, people, and I think the British feel they have a monopoly on humour and foreigners basically don't get it and their own, you know, they're just humourless and the very fact they can't speak English properly shows how obtuse they are. You know, there's that kind of underlying assumption, I think, you know, kind of monoglot culture. Um, but I'm saying that actually, in the, the very manifest of electronic music, where they're able to manifest a sort of very, very... Um, deadpan humour, of which is actually not really much of an equivalent in English culture. Anyway, it's just a paragraph. Meanwhile, in the unlikely world of electronic pop, there are groups who have managed to incorporate into their overall conceptual and sound design a deadpan, elegant humour, which is no British equivalent. Groups such as Kraftwerk, whose pioneering in electronic music of the 1970s serenely sang the praises of the automobile, the motorway, radio, robotics, all of which fans of 1970s progressive rock, with its suspicion of the mechanical and the synthetic, would have regarded as automated and banal. Kraftwerk posed as Germans in the eyes of the English. Fay, Teutonic, Square, without a trace of good old Anglo-American Anglo blues in their white bodies. <laughs> they knew what they were doing, posing as the other, trading cannily on stereotypes, exposing the dumb anti-German prejudice of Anglo-Americans. The synth-pop group Yellow Magic Orchestra would do the same thing in the late 1970s with Japanese stereotypes. Or there was the Belgian group Telex, whose elegant, subtly comic approach to pop, culminating in their representing Belgium in the 1980 Eurovision Song Contest with their entry Eurovision, a deceptively bland piece of Metischlager calibrated to come last. English pop and rock can be funny, but when so, it tends towards the novelty song, or in the case of Squeeze, Chaz and Dave, etc., sort of Afri guard conservatism, ghoul, blimey and pubbish, doggedly unpretentious. <laughs> so, that might go in the book. <laughs> but, um, Thank you. Wanna, I, yeah, I, I, I really like the range of things that you draw into the sphere of the avant-garde as well. <laughs> Something that uh, and and yeah, the, 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 definitely with the goons because of the sort of use of radio and like you know, and the fact that radio you know you, you know expansive use of radio as a medium and uh, there's a wonderful piece Delia Derbyshire did with this poet Barry Bremonge in 1964 for Radio Three you know they had the dreams and it's just you know and it's astonishing to think that something like that was broadcast you know at that time. I'm really glad you you bigged up Delia Derbyshire as much as you did in the book. Actually, I think she's much well. She got written out and now she's yeah. being written, written back in. I I never. Do you know what I? It, she just wasn't on anybody's radar um, until after she died. I think in 2001. And I mm. confess, in that point, I've not actually heard of her. And most people haven't. I and mean, if you think that their signature thing is the Doctor Who theme, well, it's credited to Ron Grainer. The same bloke mm. who writes the theme to Steptoe and Son. And I always think, blimey, this Ron Grain is very versatile. He can do the kind of doom, doom, or he can do pure electronics, not, you know, really. Like Didier Derbyshire had been effaced out of, um, out of history. It actually made me would go to YouTube and listen to the uh, four minute long version of the Doctor Who theme tune again. because it, And it's so brilliant. It sounded <laughs> like it was made yesterday. It's, it's so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was something that we all grew up with and yeah. you know, took for granted. Um, mm. You know, the, the things of radiophonic workshop is definitely. Um... Yeah, I have, a, I have a very nice colleague in um, the music department at the University of Manchester who's doing some work on Delia Derbyshire and, and working with some archival material. And there's, there's a lot of interest in a lot of stuff. And, and, and Cozy Fanatuti actually, out of Thorin Grizzle, she's writing a book about Delia Derbyshire, a sort of, well, of which Delia Derbyshire figures, you know, it's a, it's a follow up to her autobiography. So, mm. yeah. So we've got a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Um, <coughs> um, I'm, 
actually invite people to I ask their so, questions yeah, if yeah. you would like to. So, um, Simon and Eric, do you want to actually ask your questions? You don't have to, but you can if you would like to to unmute and um, <laughs> can put your webcam on or not, depending on that. Uh, Simon, uh, really enjoyed that. Absolutely great stuff. Um, what do you think of current asset techno? So, you know, tracks like Coin Girl, uh, which to me don't seem that different. They seem like they, they you know, they could be 90s. Um, and then, like, you know, stuff like Paula Temple. And has it, is this another example of uh, a previously countercultural phenomenon? that has now been totally recuperated by the machine. Yeah, well, I have to give you an answer to that, which was that I found out about Paula Temple because of the algorithm recommending her to me on SoundCloud. That's how, and then I was like, oh, this is really good. It sounds like 19 and it sounds like Acid House from back in the day. And then I was like, oh, it's new. It was, it was, yeah. And, and it, so I don't know, what does that say about how, I, how one finds out about things now? And then I sort of felt slightly sad about that too. It's interesting that you brought her up. I mean, I think it's great, but it isn't, it is assimilation, I think, it, you know, it's been sucked into the culture and now it's being regurgitated again. I suppose the only, I mean, I, and I don't really much know, <laughs> I don't really know about those artists, but I would just, I do, what I do think is a sort of potential and great saving future grace for electronic music is the potential for, for queering and manifesting, you know, you think of like forms like rock are so gendered really you know and it's obviously plenty of people have managed to get over that even jazz you know in the horn or whatever you know and electronic music is just so much less gendered in that way and yes. and i think there's just the malleability of it and i think the potential um to kind of embrace use and express diversity i, I think you know, it's going ahead sorry that doesn't answer the question about paula temple <laughs> i haven't revised paula temple so i, I don't know but uh eric do you want to come in with your question as well so sure yeah hi guys sorry really enjoyed the the chat i actually just following on from what david said there i was um interested to see if you guys had heard of uh, about senyawa's new album which was uh, released yesterday who are sort of uh, indonesian twosome and um it was released yesterday simultaneously by 44 independent labels around but the world yeah all of whom sort of produced, uh, provided their own remixes, did their own artwork, their different physical release schedules. And and there's something about what those guys are doing that I find really interesting and progressive. I was looking at sort of CTM's recent uh, festival payment format where you could sort of get a wallet and give individual payments to people. And I, I feel like at the moment, I'm really excited by actually being able to use the internet, not just to reach a lot of people, but to do things in a totally new way and also about how that sort of relates to, you know, there's been a lot of talk about <clears throat> Make Techno Black again this year. And I feel a lot of it, the sort of collectives and artists and labels that are really interesting to me are sort of previously more margin marginalised or invisible communities, the queer community, uh, the non-Western community. Um, and so for me, that's, you know, there's some really exciting things going on, like non-worldwide, Yes, No Wave, Nyege Nyege tapes, you know, More yeah, Mother, yeah. just... All the people who are exciting me are, are really exciting me and they're from background that we haven't really seen a lot of so that's just your thoughts on that really yeah i mean there's various things there first of all i'm glad that there are more effective ways that people can actually pay musicians you know in much simpler ways i think for a long time it, it didn't they haven't really figured it out and it was hard and sometimes people just got into a lazy habit and a took for granted that music on, on it was there just to be consumed for free and i mean oh, that's terrible I'm, I'm glad that people are beginning to break the habit people can easily afford to sort of lob a few quid you know, the, you know a, cup, a cup of coffee or whatever um and you know it just makes the difference um you know and things like patreon etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm always glad to see that those things are happening second point yeah it's absolutely true i mean um that electronic music is, I mean, we did perhaps, and perhaps history's not my intent to sort of stress historically, you know, the sort of key zones of like Germany, Detroit, or whatever, London, and France, whatever, to an extent. But yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's become global, it is global. It's a bit like, like hip hop. I remember interviewing Chuck D in about 1990, and he was talking about, hey, you know, hip hop isn't just um, New York. It isn't just Los Angeles, they've got hip hop in Atlanta. And I remember thinking, this seems a bit wish, I was thinking this is a bit wish -ry. I think it's just New York. And yeah, of course, within <laughs> hip hop is now absolutely global. And I think there's a similar thing happening with electronic music. And I mean, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. Indonesia, Iran, you know, Africa, North Africa, whatever. 
that, you know, it's becoming a sort of lingual franca. And of course, so much is being added, you know, to, you know, it isn't just taking up this kind of preset, preset styles of the terror, it's just bringing so much, you know, in terms of folk tradition, character, use diversity, etc. you know, in, enriching it. And I think, uh, um, and I think, you know, it's, it's possible to do that within the open field of electronic music. And I, you know, I think that's absolutely tremendous. Yeah, I think decolonize, please. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. the issue that I have with Bergheim, although, you know, it is a queer space, is that it's predominantly a white queer space and yeah. also predominantly a male, although, you know, there were women there. I'd say a third of the people there were women. A third of them were techno fans and a third of them were gay men. And that was probably how it divided. Um, I'm going to drop a big name, but my, one of my students is Josie Rebell, or was, well, she graduated last year amazing DJ, one of the best female DJs we've got, I think, in the UK at the minute. And she played Berghain and she was like the only, pretty much the only person of colour in the club. Yeah. You know, that, that, and that becomes quite obvious, really, and sad. And I suppose the other issue for me was that Birmingham, which is where I was really, that was my early stomping ground. Birmingham is really, truly, genuinely, to my understanding of it and my, uh, my experience of it properly, multicultural it really is it's just more than London it's just everybody's Birmingham first and then whatever second everybody comes from Birmingham and the music scene there I felt was very much it lent much more towards Detroit and it had a lot of that sense of having taken the jazz and the I don't know the music felt mixed in a different kind of way and also the kind of tribal house stuff that was happening in Nottingham and it was also not just being driven by white people there was kind of a collectives of, of Brummies that were making stuff happen and they were from everywhere and I'd love to see, I hope that happens again, that needs to happen. And there was that ex um, exhibition of electronic music they had um, recently, um, I forgot what it was, in Kensington. And one of the exhibits, which I, I, I enjoyed it very much as far as it goes, but one of the exhibits, I think, is it Gursky who does the sort of long, large scale photos? Anyway, it was one of a club and I think it was in Berlin and it was massive and it was huge. And I think every single face in it was white. Mm. <laughs> and that's, you know, and it's, it's, that, that's just, you know, that's obviously a sort of pity because I think everything else about that, that's going to be completely commendable. But yeah. yeah. In, a, in a challenge to my multitasking, I'm also receiving texts from people who are on YouTube or Facebook or somewhere else. Um, so Alison, who you know, I think, Julia as well, sent me an enormously long question. Hi, Alison. <laughs> I'm not going to read all of this because it's too long. Um, but um, talking about recession and empty buildings and places being used as art spaces, maybe, um, and the kind of screen fatigue that we are experiencing currently, I'm sure. Um, and she asks, Do we, will the internet actually save us by forcing us back into analog life um, and even out of the cities to have the best raves? Can we challenge the criminal justice bill once and for all? Um, or do we need new drugs to really make the change to how we enjoy music? Because of course, that's is an element we haven't really talked about since we've been recorded. I can think F <laughs> what drugs? I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I don't know. Are we going to have this sort of um, post-COVID kind of breaking out into these spaces again? And you know, I think people are going to start throwing their phones in the canal. I really do. I think there'll be a moment where people are so glad to see each other. I did see a cartoon in the New Yorker, I think it was, that said, oh, I can't wait to go back to a bar and scroll through my phone again, um, <laughs> which I thought was kind of yeah, funny. But I do actually I do actually genuinely think that I've, I've seen a lot of people just say, oh, God, I don't want to take my phone out. I just want to go and actually see people and, and realising what we've missed or what we're losing or what we we've lacking in this year of being in lockdown i think has made everybody very sick of being on screen um yeah yeah it's in i mean it's in, i mean futurology is always a kind of mugs mugs game whatever because you know the whole my in the 30 odd years i've been writing about music you know i've never really you know predicted anything it just happens and it just um that it manifests itself completely unpredictable on the end of my nose or whatever. So, um, yeah, um, I just wonder if if there's a drive to that sort of analog thing. It's almost, almost going back to a sort of prehistory or whatever. And I don't know about, you know, phones as tracking devices or whatever, you know, might people sort of want to, you know, be in a space that is completely beyond, you know, beyond, um, you know, like leave your phones at the door or whatever or something like that. Um, or don't bring your phone at all. Um, yeah, resort, you know, take yourself off grid in order to kind of, you know, sort of have your cultural experience, you know, and so, so, but, you know, you can off grid and therefore, 
you know, beyond surveillance. Um, yeah. I, but I do think, I do feel genuinely that dancing is a human need. It's something, it doesn't matter, you know, that, that moving your body to, to a beat, to some music and with other people in the company of others is a, is a very basic human need. It's something that, you know, however bad we might be at doing it, at some point we will all be moved to, 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 to jerk our body along to something. Yeah. And it's a physiological part of our humanity, I think. I think, that, I really feel, oh, for me, I feel that very strongly. And it's interesting because really since the sort of late 80s, it has, you know, there's a sort of shift, you know, to gain, you know, unity in the field, you know, en masse. And that hasn't really gone away. I mean, no, exactly. 30 years on, it's not like, oh, it'll be like this for a few years, then there'll be a revival of individualism on the dance floor. No, I didn't really mm-hmm. happen. I mean, you know, there's been a kind of continuum, really, you know, since 89. So there's no reason why, you know, that, that won't go on. It might be a surprise if there's suddenly a kind of dialectical shift and then suddenly... <laughs> it's it's all about individualism again uh and tribalism whatever i don't know i'm gonna end at this point because i think that's quite a nice you know thinking about maybe the kind of positive possibilities post covid and the ways that we might um, return to some of these ways of enjoying music and enjoying being present and enjoying maybe even not being surveyed in various ways. Um, <laughs> Pete's just gonna cough in the background <laughs> when I do this. <laughs> so um, thank you so much to Julia Bell and David Stubbs for brilliant reading and discussion and uh, yeah, just lots of very thought provoking stuff. Um, I want to thank Grow for organizing this, including Pete, who's <laughs> in the background. Um, I want to say thank you to our invisible but ever-present and essential sound engineer, David, who is there in the background. Thank you to everybody who has come and who's been watching either um, in the Zoom call or um, on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, and apologies for people whose questions I didn't get to. Um, just a reminder that uh, tomorrow there is the next um, event in this series, um, which is uh, an artist talk with the East London based painter and sculptor Emily Hammer. Um, and that's happening tomorrow at 7pm. So if you follow Grow on social media and so on, you can find out about that. Um, so do keep supporting the series. Thank you to the Arts Council for their um, actual financial support of the series. Um, and thanks again to Julia and David for um, just brilliant discussions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Love to meet you. Um, And have a great night, everybody. Thanks a lot for your time.